Thank you for joining us again today for our continuing study through the book of Revelation. In our last study, we looked at the first six verses of chapter 3 and the church in Sardis. Today, we want to look through verses 7 through 13 and look at the church at Philadelphia. If the church of Sardis could be described by the Lord as a church that had a reputation for being alive but was dead, Philadelphia may be described as a church that has a reputation for being dead but is alive. And so I want to look at a church that God only had positive things to say about. Only this church and the church at Smyrna did Jesus only have glowing report of. I've got on the screen a picture of two churches, one a, a large mega church and the other a small country church. Which of these two churches do you think is alive and on fire for God? Well, we, we really can't know by looking at the picture. The, the large church may be experiencing the full blessings and power of God, and the small church as well. Just because a church is large doesn't necessarily mean God's blessings are residing on it. Or just because a church is small doesn't mean that God's blessings is not on that church. You can be large and living for God, and you can be a large church and not living for God. And the same can be true in a, a small church. You know, sometimes we evaluate a church based on its size. How many people go down there? If a lot of people go, it must be a good church. What is the budget like? How much money do they have in their bank account? What type of facilities do they have? What type of programs do they have? What type of people go there? Are there some influential people that attend that church? There's all kinds of measuring rods that people use from a human standard that may not give a, a correct spiritual evaluation of a church. God has given to the Apostle John, who has been banished to the Isle of Patmos, letters or thoughts to give to seven churches in Asia Minor, we know as Western Turkey today. And so this is the next to the last letter that John writes. And these letters were to be read publicly at the churches. Everybody in the congregation would know what God thinks about them. And this church had to be pleased with the report that God wrote about them. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8, we read these words. I know all the things that you do. I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have a little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Now, we saw in the last study that the church at Sardis had a few people in it that had not soiled their garments who had not given over their lives to habits and behaviors that dishonored God. We read again that the church in Philadelphia had a little strength. And I believe that's not talking about the majority of the people were not living for God, but it was just a small congregation. Maybe on a good day they would have 15 or 20 people come to their church meeting. And again, in those days they met in church houses as opposed to church facilities like we see today. People might look at that church and say, well, there's not a lot of people that go to that church. Uh, God's blessings can't be there. I wouldn't want to visit there. But that was not what God said about the church. Even though they were small in number, they were great in their commitment to Jesus Christ. This was a church that was blessed of God. Now again, I'm not saying that a, a small church is blessed of God and a large church is not. Each church is individually evaluated according to their loyalty and their commitment to Christ. And do they meet the requirements of God, like we saw last week in our study of the church at Sardis? Verse 9 of chapter 3 says, Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogues, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. In the area of Philadelphia, there were a number of Jewish people living there. The Apostle Paul would say, you're not a Jew just because you were born Jewish. Circumcision of the flesh is not really what God's desiring, even though that is a mark of Jewishness. 
Circumcision of the heart is what God requires. In other words, when you give your life to Christ, He's not looking for an outward cutting of the flesh, but an inward cutting of the heart, spiritually to be made right with God. So, these Jews who were meeting in the synagogue are described by the Lord as the synagogue of Satan because of the way they're acting and the way they're treating the fellow Christians. They're lying about them. They're saying things that are not true. They're slandering their commitment to Christ. Some Jews would say that Christians were cannibals because when they meet together for their love feast, they eat the body of Christ and they drink his blood and they made a, a holy communion time, something that was slanderous and blasphemous. You know, you watch the news today, you can't always believe what you hear. They put their own uh, view of the news in a way that suits their personal agendas. And when you find out all the facts about a story, they're not exactly like they were presented on the news. That was what was happening with these Jewish people. They were saying things about these Christians living in Philadelphia that were not true. And Jesus said, you're going to have to endure their lies and their slander. Some of you are losing your jobs. Some of you are losing your family. Some of you are losing your lives because of the lies that are being told about you. But there's coming a day when I'm going to even the score. And these Jews who are so proud and glad that they've hurt you and your reputation, one day they're going to bow and acknowledge that you are the ones that I really love. You may be going through things in your life right now where People are slandering you and lying about you, and it's caused you a lot of grief and a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble. Paul said in the book of Romans, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. There are situations in our life that we just got to turn over to God. They may not get better very soon, but there's coming a day when God's going to make all wrongs right. It may be in this life. It'll surely be in the next life. But to this church, he says, I, I know what's going on. I know what people are saying about you. I know how wrongly you're being treated. But continue to be faithful to me, which this church was. In chapter 3 and verse 7, we read, Write this letter to the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key to David. When he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. Again, we see a description of Christ's character given to the church by way of encouragement. He says, I am the one that's holy and true. I'm the one that's set apart for holiness. There's no sin in God's life, and we are called to be holy like he's holy. We should be set apart to God as well. And amidst all the lies and all the slander and all the falsehoods, that were being said about them. Jesus said, I'm the one that tr that's true. I know the true story of your life. I see your character. I see your integrity. And I'll bless you for it. I'm also the one who has the key of David. I can open up doors of opportunity for you, and nobody can close them. And I can close doors of opportunity, and no one can open them. I believe this is a story or an illustration or analogy from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 through 22. Listen to these words. And then I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, to replace you. I will dress him in your royal robes, and I will give him your title and your authority, and he will be a father to the people of Jerusalem and Judea. I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest possession in the royal court. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. And when he closed doors, no one will be able to open them. Eliakim was given the key to the treasuries of the kingdom. And when he opened the treasury, which he had the authority to do, he would allow people to avail themselves to the treasuries of the kingdom. But when he closed the door, no one else had the key or the authority to open the door and avail themselves to those treasures. I believe that is the idea that God is saying to this, this church in Philadelphia. You may be small in number. You may be lied about. People might not think you're all that. 
but I want you to know my blessings upon you. And I'm going to open up doors of opportunities of ministry to you that nobody else will have. I've got the right to open the doors and I've got the right to close them. I'm the one with all authority. I am Jehovah God. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, In the meantime, I will be staying here in Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. Paul said, I, I know what it's like to be lied about. I know what it's like to be slandered. I know what it's like to be threatened. And sometimes ministry can be tough. But amidst all the spiritual warfare that's going on, God has opened up some doors of opportunity. There's some people being saved. And I'm going to stay here for a while to continue the work that God has begun and the hearts that God has opened and the opportunities God has given. It has been a while in the life of our church when I've seen God open up so many doors of opportunity. I've had more people mention to me in the last month and a half, two months, about wanting to come to church or visit church or get back in church. And I believe they're sincere in that. I believe it's really a desire of their heart. The issue is it's hard to get over that, that obstacle and barrier of not being in church for a while. And, and church is not the answer to our questions or our problems. But church is a way that we can worship God and we can learn more about God and be encouraged in our faith and our walk with Christ. We've seen a couple people come to salvation in the last few weeks here at the church and it just seems like more and more people are being open to hear the gospel of Christ or the invitation of the church. You know, we're living in some tough times in our society today. There's a lot of legislation being passed and a lot of actions being uh, involved in with people's lives that, that are just contrary to the ways of God. We're living in dark days. But I, I used to say, you know, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And I wonder if some of the trials and directions that our church, our, our nation is going in is making people think about their own life. Maybe some of the natural disasters are making people think about eternity in their own life. Uh, in the last two, two and a half months, I've either officiated or attended about 20 funerals. God has opened up doors, even through difficult times in people's lives, to get them to think about God and their relationship with Him. And so the Apostle Paul echoed what God said to the church at Philadelphia. I'm opening up some doors of opportunity for you. What opportunities are God given to you? Sometimes people come to the church come to me at church and say, you know, this needs fixing or, or, or we need to do this or we need to do the other. I heard a statement several years ago that said, a need seen is an opportunity given. <laughs> Sometimes when we see a need, rather than asking somebody else to attend to it, maybe it's something that we need to do ourselves. Now, I understand there are some situations that we're not uh, equipped to minister to or to be involved with. I understand that. But what opportunities are, is God opening to you or for you or to you? Maybe somebody that's coming into your life that's beginning to ask you about Jesus Christ or ask you about church, and, and the opportunity is just wide open. God's just opened the door, and there they are. Take opportunities that God gives you. Walk through those doors. You see, there's some people that you know and I know that will come to Christ, and it's as if the treasury of the kingdom of God is open and they have the blessings of God on their life that they never had before. It was a closed door because they were not Christians. But they accepted Christ and everything opened up to them. It was a new world, literally and figuratively. Verses 10 and 11 say of chapter 3, Because you have obeyed my commands to persevere in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the slander, in the midst of the falsehood that was said against this church. They kept on keeping on. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you, if you faint not. Don't let, don't let some comment that somebody says to you at church that hurts your feelings make you quit serving God. You're not going to have to answer to them one day. They're going to have to answer for their actions. You persevere. If God's called you to do something, don't let anything keep you from doing it. This church at Philadelphia, in spite of all the opposition against them, they persevered. 
Jesus says, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Most scholars and commentators believe this is a reference to the tribulation period. As we study through the book of Revelation, chapter 1, we see the, the past in the description of Jesus Christ and His glory. As we come to chapters 2 and 3, I think we see the present age of things which are in the seven churches in Asia Minor. When we come next in our next study in a couple weeks to chapters 4 and 5, John is transported to heaven and he sees what heaven's like. But then when we come to chapter 6 through chapter 19, we read about a great time of tribulation, a seven-year period that's going to come upon this earth. After chapter 3, we don't see the church anymore. And so I believe that the church is going to be raptured and taken out of here before this time of testing comes on the world. God's going to save us from wrath. And I believe to this church, he's saying, you may be going through some problems now, but the great time of testing, not from the Jews of the synagogue of Satan, but my testing upon the whole world, you're not going to be there to go through it. I'm going to spare you from that. So hold on to what you have. Keep living for me. Keep doing what you're doing because you're honoring me so that no one will take away your crown, your blessings, your reward from the Lord. Verse 12, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God and I will also write on them my new name. Here we see intimacy with God. God loves this church, and God loves his, his followers. He loves his children. He says to this church, I'm going to make you victorious. You're going to be like pillars in the temple of my God. Now, there were a number of earthquakes that rocked the city of Philadelphia, and they were continually having to go out of the city and then when things calmed down, many times they were near the epicenter and there were tremors that followed that. They would leave the city for a while and then they would come back in. And then something else would happen. They were, their, their town would be rocked by an earthquake and they would go out again for safety. And when things were better, they would come back in. Sometimes buildings were demolished. And the only things that were left standing were the, the pillars that had a firm foundation. And I believe Jesus plays on that to say, just like you come back into town and you still see some of the pillars standing after the earthquake. You who are faithful to me, I count as my victorious ones. You're going to be pillars in my temple. I'm going to put upon you my new name. You're going to have a new city, the city of Jerusalem, that's going to come down to this earth one day, and I'm going to use you for my glory. What a, what a statement and a encouragement to these people. They were faithful to God in the midst of persecution, in the midst of slander, in the midst of falsehood. And God said, you just keep on living for me. You keep on persevering. I've got a special place <coughs> in my kingdom for you. And then he closes as he does many of these letters to these churches. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit says and understand what he says to the churches. Are we listening today? Maybe God's opening up doors of opportunity for you, and He wants you to take that opportunity. It may not always be open. God may close that door of opportunity. So step in while the door is open. Maybe you felt like giving up or you've been discouraged because somebody like the Jews in the synagogue of Satan, maybe somebody at your church or somebody at our church has said something to you and it hurt your feelings. Or they did something to you that caused you some pain. And you thought, I'm not going back to that church again. I'm not going to serve the Lord anymore. Persevere through that. God's going to take care of that. You continue to be faithful. And one day God's going to exalt you and reward you for your faithfulness to Him. And you're going to be a pillar in the temple of God. And God's going to plant you there. And people are going to know that you're the ones that He loves and that loved Him. By way of application and thoughts in closing our time together today, just remember the verse that we looked at, that God is the one who opens the doors. And when he opens them, no one can close them. 
And when he closes doors of opportunity, no one can open them. <coughs> and so think about your life. What opportunities is God opening for you? Write it down. Ask God to help you to walk through that door and accomplish his will through your life as his vessel. And then there's a message I preached recently called The Lost Sheep. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that message as it talks about the opportunities that God gives us and our need to follow through. I hope you'll join us for our next study as we look at the last church in the book of Revelation, the church at Laodicea.